Um, cool, so this is yeah, my talk on why Scrum isn't agile, but you should be. Uh, so to start with the kind of purpose of this talk, um, so it's not all um, anti-Scrum and pro-agile, it's more about the distinction between the two, and um, I guess why you should be agile, but yeah, why, why the two aren't the same word, they don't mean the same thing, but they do, they get used to mean the same thing an awful lot, and so it's all just to clear up the distinction there. <laughs> The idea is that hopefully most of you guys have heard of Scrum and Agile before. Does that sound about right? No? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, you hopefully have a vague idea of what Scrum and Agile are. I'll go into a little bit about what they are, um, but yeah, not, not too much detail. So hopefully you've heard of those before. Um, and finally, I've been told I have a tendency to talk like everything I say is fact. This is all my opinion. So uh, yeah, I should get that out up front. So who am I? Uh, my name is David Thomas, I'm a senior developer at Scott Logic. Um, and I've always been more interested, rather than the sort of techie side of things, just about how software is developed, the, the kind of cross-technology stuff. So I've got quite a strong interest in software design, but also the kind of processes behind software development, hence this talk. Um, I've been developing software for seven years now, um, and really it was in my last job at SN Systems where I got quite into Agile, got quite keen on this sort of stuff, and sort of brought that into Scott Logic. Um, so I've really been pushing at Scott Logic for greater acceptance of Agile, and I think I've had some success there. It's a little bit difficult with us because we're a consultancy, so it sort of depends on what the clients want as to what we do, but um, yeah, it's, it, we've, had, we've had some progress with that. Uh, and finally, Sam, not the Dave Thomas. I don't know if anyone was expecting the Dave Thomas, but well, you're optimistic if you were. Um, those of you who don't know, Dave Thomas is one of the Agile Manifesto uh, authors and also the author of the Pragmatic Programmer, and that's not me, believe it or not. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, talking about Scrum and Agile. So I thought I'd start with, what is Scrum? Uh, and the easiest way to do that is by ripping off the Scrum Guide. Um, Scrum is a framework for developing and sustaining complex products. So throughout the Scrum Guide, they really focus on calling it a framework. It's essentially it's a software development process. I think they shy away from the word process, but that, that's what it is. Uh, it was written in 1995 by a couple of guys, um, Ken Schwaber and Jess Sutherland were their names. Um, and they, they've sort of been developing it ever since, so they do carry on updating it. Uh, and yeah, I can't remember when the most recent version was released, but relatively recently, I think. Um, it's based around iterative development. So the idea with iterative development is, um, well, I guess it's as opposed to stage development. So in stage development, like waterfall, you'd have your nice big analysis phase, nice big design phase, nice big implement yeah, implementation phase. Sorry. Uh, the idea with iterative development is you're doing that every couple of weeks or every month or so. So you're doing all of those phases, but you're doing them over and over and over again. Um, there's a whole bunch of roles and rituals in Scrum, um, so product owners, Scrum masters, developers, uh, and then yeah, the rituals are a bunch of meetings that you have, so you have your daily Scrum and your Scrum planning, and your Scrum review and your retrospectives, and yeah, so the Scrum guide kind of details what all of those are, but I'm guessing again if you've heard of Scrum you probably have a vague idea of what most of those are. Uh, not too important for this talk though, that's cool. Um, it includes the idea of continuous improvement, that's sort of core to continuous improvement. I put up the term Kaizen, because um, I think that was one of the original ideas, it's a Toyota thing I think, uh, and that, that is the idea that um, any process should include within the process a method for improving that process. And that's where the Scrum retrospective comes in, so every sprint you look back how that sprint went, look at how you developed, and uh, yeah, try and improve on it. So that's really important in Scrum. And finally, um, it says it's implemented whole or not at all, which I just thought is a little bit weird, but this is, again, a direct quote from the Scrum Guide. So Scrum's roles, artifacts, events, and rules are immutable, and although implementing only parts of Scrum is possible, the result is not Scrum. Scrum exists only in its entirety and functions well as a container for other techniques, methodologies, and practices. So I find this a little bit weird. Um, firstly, the claim that it's immutable. Well, they've been developing it for the past 20 years. It's not immutable. They keep changing it. Um, but I was also curious about the motivation behind this. So why would you say it's only Scrum if you do all of it? What if you do a little bit less than all of it? You're just not allowed to call it Scrum? I, I find it a bit weird. And I guess the main reason is they're perhaps trying to discourage people from picking bits and pieces of it and saying, look, you should do this as a whole or do it not at all. And we'll get onto that a little bit later. So what is Agile? That's kind of the other half of this. Um, a set of values for software development. So. 
I kind of thought a lot about how to describe it, and it is a really widely used term, but I think that sort of does describe it pretty nicely. So the Agile Manifesto was written in 2001 by 17 guys who got together in a ski lodge. I have no idea why they got together in a ski lodge, but <laughs> that's where they decided to do it. Maybe they're all skiers. <laughs> um, and so the reason I've gone with a set of values is because the core of the Agile Manifesto is those four main values, uh, which we'll get onto in a bit, uh, and they're backed by 12 principles, which are sort of derived, I guess, from those four values. I can't guarantee that this is true, but I think agility basically refers to being responsive to change. So they made the claim that the only constant in software development is change. And I guess Agile is yeah, being responsive to that change, as opposed to the sort of older methods, which you do your big kind of planning phase and all of that, and well then change is quite expensive because you've got to go back and do all your planning again. So I think that's where the, the term comes from. And it's sort of, it's used as an umbrella term for things like XP and Scrum, and it's quite often, as I said at the start, used synonymously with, with Scrum in particular, but I think XP terms as well. People just say, oh yeah, this is all Agile, and yeah. But really, whilst I'm, uh, Agile is a bit of an umbrella, really it refers to those four values and 12 principles that are written in the uh, Agile Manifesto. So, why is Scrum associated with Agile? Um, I think it's probably fairly true to say that it is. Like I said, they're often used interchangeably. I've regularly heard Scrum described as being an Agile process. Um, and yeah, people say they're being Agile when they're being Scrum, and people say they're being Scrum when they're being Agile. I, I think it's fair to say they're pretty heavily associated. And there are some really good reasons for that. Um, iterative development, which is sort of at the core of um, Scrum, is really responsive to change. So as I said before, if you do your big sort of planning phase and then do your implementation, if you have to change something midway through your implementation, you've got to go back and do that planning all over again. So that's not very responsive to change. On the other hand, if you're doing all of that every two weeks, then that's really easy to change. You can change every two weeks. I guess you can change more regularly than that, but yeah, that, that's allowed you to be far more responsive, which is what agility is all about, or being agile is all about. Scrums, it's kind of a good fit for a lot of the agile values. So uh, one of the agile values is um, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and Scrum specifies that you have a product owner. The role of the product owner is to encourage uh, customer collaboration, so that's quite a nice fit there. Similarly, um, one of the principles in Agile is uh, for continuous improvement, and as we discussed with Scrum, that's kind of a core part of it. Um, and then there's the real reason, which is that Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland were involved in developing both, but that sort of seems like a bit of a cheap reason. But yeah, they're, they're two of the 17 guys who got together in that ski lodge and wrote the uh, Agile Manifesto, so I think that's probably a lot of why they're actually linked. So, why is Scrum not Agile? kind of the core of the talk, I guess. It means quite a lot of things, that question, I think. It seems like a simple question, but it's, it's a few different things. So firstly, why are they not the same thing? Why is it wrong to say something is Scrum when actually it's Agile? Why is it wrong to say something is Agile when it's Scrum? Well, they're, they're just straight out different things. Scrum is defining a process for software development, whereas Agile is defining a set of values within which you develop software. And there's not an awful lot of overlap between a set of values and a process. They're, they're, they're just different types of things. Just doing Scrum is not Agile, so yeah, why is Scrum not Agile? Maybe that could say, why is just doing Scrum not Agile? And basically, I guess the, reason, the, the core reason for that is come down to the first of the values from the Agile Manifesto, which is people, interaction, people and interactions over processes and tools. So if you start, by, um, start being Agile by saying, we're going to follow this process, well, that's not really agile because it says people and interactions are more important than processes and tools. If, if we're just going to go and follow this process, that's not really being agile. Scrum's immutability is kind of unagile, I think. Um, essentially, with agile, you're saying you should continuously improve. You should self-organize as well. That's one of the, the principles in agile. Is self-organization is really, really important. Well, if instead of self-organizing, you say, let's just follow what Scrum says, let's just do that, that's not really being agile at all. So the immutability there, I think, it discourages certain, certain parts of agility. And then the final thing, which is really, really important, and this can't be a criticism of Scrum at all, is that Scrum doesn't have any technical practices. Now, this is for a very good reason, that people developing Scrum just wanted to develop a nice framework for uh, how to develop software. They didn't want to say, look, these are the specific things that you have to do day to day when you're developing software. So they left out technical practices, left it there as they described as a framework for developing software. 
But those technical practices, you can't get away from them. They're really, really important. If you just go ahead and say, right, we're going to follow Scrum, Scrum's going to allow us to develop software really, really quickly. If we do that and don't bother with our kind of refactoring, with our testing, with all that sort of stuff, you're probably going to get yourself into trouble. So again, just doing Scrum there without all of those technical practices, without especially the kind of stuff in XP, that's going to get you into trouble. It's not going to be very agile. Why should you be agile? I guess that's the other core part of the talk. Uh, I should start by saying I could spend an entire talk doing this. I could probably spend a week's worth of talks doing this. Um, I don't expect anyone out there who's a massive cynic about Agile to turn around at the end of this and be like, yeah, you totally convinced me. Um, but I thought I'd sort of, I, I kind of have to include it, right, because the talk says why well, you should be Agile. So I also, I had a nice list of bullet points um, about why Agile was awesome and the great things about it and all of that. And I kind of figured, how could I actually write it better than they have written it themselves? So I thought I'd just put up the four, four values from the Agile Manifesto and then say why I think they're important. Uh, so, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Oh, I should say with these actually. They write this, this is a really important part of the Agile Manifesto. They say these things on the left here are more important than the things on the right. Things on the right, that's not to say they're unimportant, that they're bad, that they're evil and you should never do them. The things on the left are just more important and you shouldn't let the things on the right get in the way of the things on the left. Don't forget that. Um, and yeah, I managed to not forget it, pretty proud. Um, um, so the first of those, I think this is the most difficult to defend of the four values. Um, and equally, I think it's actually the most key, maybe. I don't know. Um, but it's really, really important. So the argument is that individuals and interactions are more important than processes and tools. So what, what we're trying to say here, a process is essentially taking a way that something is done, taking some steps and saying, right, that worked there, let's do this again over here. We can follow that process, do it again. The problem with doing that in software development is software development, I don't know if you guys have noticed this as developers, but it's really complicated, really, really complicated. <laughs> And so trying to say, we've got this simple process, this simple way of developing software, we're going to do that again and again and again. It doesn't work. Not only does it not work, if it did work, someone would go and write that piece of software that would write all the other software and then well, we would all be out of jobs and that'd be terrible. With software development, good individuals are the real, real key. I think it's probably quite rare when someone's saying, why is that software project successful? They might come out and say, oh, we have this brilliant process, we use these great tools, whatever. Probably rare to say, we had some absolutely brilliant people and they just worked so well together, they absolutely clicked. However, nine times out of 10, if you've got a successful project, that's probably gonna be why it is. So I think that's kind of key. That's the thing to focus on. It's not to say that the processes and tools are bad. I'm not saying don't use processes and tools. I'm just saying focus on getting great people and getting them working well together. Working software over comprehensive documentation. I think this is the easiest to defend by far. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's more important to say, we've got this really, really great piece of software, and then say, look, we've got this documentation saying that we're gonna write this great piece of software. <laughs> you can demonstrate one, you can prove that it works. You can actually get it out to customers, and customers can start using it, they can get value from it. Documentation is useful, but it shouldn't be the goal, it should never be the goal. And I think in some of the sort of more traditional ways of developing software, at times it felt a bit like it was the goal. It, it was the important thing to write the uh, documentation, but yeah. Hopefully, it's clear that actually having working software is kind of important in software development. Uh, next up, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So, I think the thing with contract negotiation, this is perhaps the sort of the, the obvious way of developing software is you, you get together with your client, you ask them exactly what they want, you figure it out perfectly, and then you go off and write it. The problem with that is, again, as I'm sure a lot of you know, customers tend to be wrong when they say what they think they want. And so if you get that all down in the contract at the start, what you're gonna go and do is develop that wrong thing. The great thing about customers is when you show them something wrong, they're usually like, yeah, that's totally wrong. So if you collaborate with them, work with them regularly, show them what they've asked for and show them how it doesn't work, they'll then come up with something that's slightly better, something that works better. So by collaborating regularly with customers rather than just agreeing everything in a contract, then you're gonna develop something better. There's also a another side to this. Contract negotiation to me is a form of waste. Um, and waste in software development is really bad. If we can get rid of it, all the better we can develop quicker. Um, by spending a load of time signing up a contract, getting everything agreed, getting something that everyone's happy with, you're taking a lot of time to do that. 
you might be taking a month or six weeks doing that, and that's time when you could be writing software and getting something out there. So, yeah, I don't think contract negotiation is very effective. I think it's definitely very wasteful. There, there is, of course, a place for it. Sometimes you can't just be like, yeah, let's all get out and develop great software. You do need some agreements in place, but in general, you want to be collaborating rather than just signing up to everything. And then the final one, which probably is the core of everything from agility. Uh, so responding to change over following a plan. As I said, change is the constant within software development. So if you come up with this big, brilliant plan, it can be the best plan in the world. It's never going to never gonna survive contact with the enemy, as they say. Um, you, you're going to get like a couple of months into this and be like, yeah, this plan was all wrong. We've learned all these things while developing. We should throw this away and start again. Now, because this is guaranteed, you probably want to work in a way that allows you to respond to change. There's all sorts of change as well. I think probably everyone knows this, but you're going to get customers changing their mind. They're going to say they want one thing, turns out they want another. Pretty standard. The market's going to change. You're going to be developing your project over two years, six months in, your competitor is going to, competitor is going to de deliver the same thing. You're going to have to be like, right, we need to take a different tack now. And the main thing for me, I think your understanding of the product is just going to change. You're going to get halfway to, through developing it and be like, yeah, actually all the things that we thought we knew, we don't know, we were wrong. We've made all these assumptions, turns out they're wrong, we've got to do something different. So it's really, really <coughs> important to be responsive to that change. I think plans are useful. Certainly, they're useful to an extent. Even Scrum has sort of sprint long plans. I think that's fair enough. You just, you've got to make sure that you're getting the detail of your plan correct for how long you're planning for. So if you're planning for three months time, you don't need to plan down to the day. It doesn't help, very, help me very much to say in three months time, I'm going to be writing this particular feature doing this. It probably <coughs> does help me to say in three days time, I'll be doing this. It might help me as well to say in three months time, we're roughly going to have a release that, that might be useful for the marketing team or something like that. So getting the kind of detail of the plan right for the length of time you're working to, that, that's worthwhile. So should you do Scrum? Um, there's a bit of a question here as to who you are. Um, I guess as a dev, I probably initially wrote this thinking of other devs. Um, but I think this actually applies to anyone. Um, this applies to, I don't know, a CTO, a team lead, whoever. Anyone can in initiate a change to Scrum. So when I say should you do Scrum, I guess the important thing, one of the most important things is that actually everyone is happy doing Scrum, everyone involved in the project. Is that, that, that's really key. Um, so you could be anyone from Norwich Junior Dev to the head of a company. Um, so maybe bear that in mind as I'm going through this. Um, and after a little bit of criticism of Scrum, I think I've probably got to admit, I do sort of love Scrum. It is awesome. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that. Iterative development really is great. Um, so it does what it says on the tin. It is, it's able to be responsive to change. And in general, it's how I work. It always it is, always, probably always will be. Um, I think there's really good separation of responsibilities, particularly with the product owner role. Um, so having someone on your team, I don't know if people have worked with a really good product owner, but having someone on your team who is really happy to say, look, this is what I need to develop, these are the key features, these are the important things, but isn't going to say, look, you need to develop it like this, or is going to be open and admit, look, they've got no idea how difficult this is, and when you tell them how difficult it is, provide them estimations, they'll be like, right, fair enough, maybe we'll drop this to the back of the pile, this is too difficult. Um, working with that kind of person is really, really great. Scrum Master, I'm not so sure. I think it's a bit of a sort of mixed bag of responsibilities. I think that, that could be broken out a bit better, but I still think just having the product owner role in itself is a bit of a genius idea. I think they should be proud of that. Um, next up, it works well with other agile practices. So because Scrum development is a really, really fast way of developing software, and it's an iterative way of developing software, so you've got to do iterative design. In iterative design, things like refactoring, unit testing, that sort of stuff is really, really important. Scrum fits in nicely with that, so I think that's that's pretty good, pretty good reason for doing it. The only thing I would say, don't do it by the book. So dis despite Jeff and Ken's claim that Scrum is immutable and you should only do the whole thing, feel free to uh, change it um, as you need it. it. It should be a kind of process to suit you. At this point, I've added intern anecdote. That's totally a reminder for me rather than something useful for you guys. Do you want to wave interns? We have our two interns from the, the summer here, and I did promise them I'd tell this an anecdote. Um, it's really good. So these guys are awesome at Agile, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so they were doing this project over the summer. Uh, it was an expenses app, is that fair to say? Yep. Um, and they worked with a couple of more senior guys at um, Scott Logic, neither of whom were me. 
and they sort of took on the kind of scrum master, product owner, mentor role. It was all sort of mixed together, so not not ideal scrum, but it was that's fine. <coughs> it was working for them, um, and they were doing their daily stand-ups. That's pretty much everyone who does any form of scrum is like, yeah, got to do daily stand-ups. That's the easy bit. So they were doing these daily stand-ups, and every morning they were like, right, what did I do yesterday? What am I going to do today? What are my impediments? And then they realized that at the start of a daily stand-up, they spent a long time standing around scratching their heads being like, what did I do yesterday? And I can totally sympathize with that because that's sort of what I'm like at the start of most daily stand-ups. I can't remember what I did yesterday. And you end up getting into that situation where you spend more time thinking about what you did yesterday and trying to remember what you did yesterday than actually listening to your teammates talking about what they're doing and helping them out with their plan for today. So they decided to take a different tack. They split their uh, daily stand-up in half. And they did the remember what you did yesterday bit yesterday, so it became remember what you did today. And then they did the planning for the next day in the morning. So initially you're thinking, wow, this is completely different to what Scrum says. Scrum says you definitely shouldn't do this, you should have your one 15 minute meeting. And who are these guys to disagree with the guys who wrote the Scrum Guide? But actually, because they were developing this app for a phone, they could deploy onto the phone every night. So instead of just having this kind of chat about what they did that previous day. They could actually demo what they did. They were getting working software into the hands of their mentors every single day. Now that is brilliantly agile. That's so much more agile than if they'd just followed Scrum by the book. So you did well. Be proud. <laughs> <laughs> so that does deserve a round of applause. I hope you did. Um, so when you're deciding whether or not you should do Scrum, there is one other thing to consider. Uh, and that is, I guess, sort of the, the core of your development process. So we've talked a little bit about iterative development and a bit about stage development. So iterative is roughly Scrum, staged is roughly Waterfall, and then finally flow-based development, which is roughly Kanban. Um, so I think we can, well, maybe we can't all see where iterative development is good, maybe I should say. Um, iterative de development tends to be pretty good for product development. So if you've got kind of plan over a couple of years, you have a rough idea of what, where you want to get, but you don't know exactly, so you know you're going to have to change along the way, but you have a rough <coughs> idea where you're going, iterative development is great. So you plan a little bit, change tack, plan a little bit more, change tack, and you, you get to roughly where you're, you're planning on going. That works really, really well. Flow-based development is where you don't have that long-term goal necessarily. Well, that's where I think it's most useful. So particularly with maintenance projects, people are just throwing stuff at you. You can't even plan for two weeks, so there's no point in even trying. You just you pick up work as it comes in. So I don't know if people have used Kanban. It's obviously a little bit rarer than Scrum, but that's what tends to happen with Scrum, uh, with Kanban. You have your work in process. You try to progress. You try to limit your work in progress, so you're not working on too many things at a time. But apart from that, you just have stuff in your backlog that keeps filling in, and you, you just do as much work as you can. There's, there's not real need for, for planning there. And then finally, stage. Um, I don't know if people think there's actually a use case for stage development, for doing waterfall development. For me, I think there is. Um, basically, the time when you want to do stage development is when that whole um, change being the constant isn't true. So uh, I, I don't think, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can predict every situation in the world, and so I'm going to go ahead and say there probably are times out there when you do know exactly what you're going to be doing over six months. There is some spec that you know you're going to have to exactly follow, you know what you're coming out with, and in that kind of case, well, doing your planning up front and your design up front, probably not a terrible idea because nothing's going to change. For me, I've never worked in that situation. I don't actually know that I've met anyone who has worked in that situation, but I'm not going to say that it's never going to happen. I, I think we should be open for that. So, I started out with a bit of scrum bashing, only a little bit, gentle scrum bashing, uh, and then said I loved it, so what's the problem? Um, I guess the problems are twofold. There are some problems with Scrum, and then there are problems with people's implementation of Scrum. So firstly, I guess, focus on uh, people's implementation of it. Well, this is mostly focusing on people's implementation of it, isn't it? Um, I guess the main issue for me is the focus on process over people. So people are going to start out a Scrum project and be like, right, first things first, we've got to figure out who the product owner is, then maybe figure out who the Scrum master is. After that, let's figure out when we're going to have our daily meetings and where and how long we're going to have our retrospectives and what room we're going to book and all that kind of stuff, which essentially isn't that important for software development. They're not going to focus on how are we actually going to get some decent developers to do this? How are we going to uh, get them so they actually get along and work well together? How are we going to get software out as early as possible? How are we going to figure out a minimum viable product? The, the kind of things that are actually key to the success of a project, people will focus on what process are we following and how are we going to, how are we going to follow it. So I don't, you can't really kind of criticize Scrum for that. that that's people's use of Scrum, but it's still it's an issue all the same. 
There's also the fact that people want to do Scrum right. They kind of think, right, well, let, Scrum says we should do this, so let's do this. I guess I've got kind of, because the Scrum guide says so, should never be the last word in any argument about how to develop software. If our interns had followed the Scrum guide exactly, they probably would have done a worse job of developing software. But it's kind of there. It's this big written down thing. It's, it's nice and kind of comfortable to follow it. So, yeah, I, I guess that's a bit of an issue, again, with people's uh, use of Scrum. And then the final thing I got there is people think that doing Scrum is the same as being Agile. Um, so everyone's heard that Agile is awesome, that Agile development works so much better than the kind of old methods. And so they're like, all right, cool. So Agile development, that's Scrum. We'll do Scrum. And that's it. And then they're sort of comfortable with that. They, they don't think about continuous improvement. All right, I know it says in Scrum you have to do continuous improvement, but people kind of figure, well, why do I have to continuously improve? I'm, I'm perfectly following the Scrum guide. What, what more improvement can I have? People will also say, well, I'm doing Scrum. Why do I need to follow all this XP stuff? Why do I need to write unit tests? Why do I need to refactor? I'm doing Scrum, right? It, it's cool. So that's a bit of an issue because that, that won't work. So again, that is it's more to do with people's use of Scrum rather than Scrum itself. But again, I think it's an issue. And if you can avoid all of this, Scrum, pretty much great. I've got a slide about what the perfect process is. I did actually write some bullet points for this, and they were rubbish. I <laughs> thought the big empty gap on the slide describes what is the perfect process better than any of my bullet points could. There isn't a perfect process. If there was, I would be out selling it rather than talking to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not true. I'm not that much of a bastard. Um, it's also not the right question to ask. Um, it's important to move away from trying to get this guarantee of success, trying to figure out the exact right way of doing something that will never fail, and instead of that, just trying to provide the right environment for people to succeed. Because if you do try and figure out this perfect way that is never going to fail, you're going to fail. That, that's sort of inevitable. Whereas if you focus on letting people get on with it, finding good people and letting them work in the best way that works for them, you're probably going to have a bit more success. I thought I'd finish this slide as well with a bit of chat about how to use the Agile Manifesto. So I've been reading the Agile Manifesto over and over again. It's really short, but I read it like all the time because I forget what's in it because, I don't know, I'm rubbish at remembering stuff. Um, and so because I was reading it so much, I was kind of like, why, why, don't people, why do people bother with Scrum? Why do people bother with XP? Why don't they just sort of read the Agile Manifesto and embody that because that would make them awesome. That's like, it's a really short, simple thing. If they just read the Agile Manifesto, they would be amazing software developers. But the Agile Manifesto is kind of, kind of vague, kind of open to interpretation, kind of difficult to make it concrete. You can't be like, right, well, it says, I don't know, um, working software of comprehensive documentation. Let's go and write some uh, working software and throw away our comprehensive documentation. That, that's hard to do on a day-by-day -day thing. So I think, actually, how the Agile Manifesto works a bit better is as a set of first principles. So something to go back to, to see, like, actually, this is going to inform my understanding of how to develop software. And that means that learning about Scrum, learning about XP, learning about all the other things that fed into the Agile Manifesto, um, learning about those things and taking lessons from that, that's really great. And you can read the Scrum Guide, and you can say, see they have uh, daily scrums, and they have planning meetings, and they have review meetings, and all of these things. And then you can say, why do they do these? What is it in the Agile Manifesto that says these are so great? And if you decide, oh, actually, yeah, this bit says them, we should definitely be doing that, brilliant. If you say, actually, this sort of goes against this principle and won't work well for us, we'll drop them. So, yeah, I'd say take the lessons from things that have developed in line with the Agile Manifesto or with that, and, yeah, then feed them back into the Agile Manifesto as a set of first principles. Finally, thought for the day. I didn't write this. I stole this from um, agileprocess.org, but I thought it was awesome. Um, sort of the only downside of it is it basically describes everything I was saying, so I could have just written this at the start and gone home. But um, yeah, I didn't. I wanted to talk to you guys. Uh, so the most important thing to know about agile methods or processes is that there is no such thing. There are only agile teams. The processes we describe as agile are environments for a team to learn how to be agile. So Scrum isn't an agile process. Scrum is a process that will give you a really good environment to be agile. But you can't just do Scrum and be like, right, we're being agile now. Do Scrum by all means. But use that as an environment to take what you've learned from Agile, from the Agile Manifesto, and really, really employ that. Because it will make it easy for you, but it won't just happen. And I guess that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. So use Scrum, it's brilliant. Be Agile, that's really key. Um, and that's about it. I was going to skip on the slide. There's one more. <laughs> you can't that, like that. Uh, yeah, so that's basically everything. I've put some further reading up here. Um, 
Obviously, my blogs deserve to be up with these other three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with that, is there? Um, so, obviously, the Agile Manifesto.org, aside from having a terrible background, which that website does, it's really, really good. Scrum.org, really interesting, heavily Scrum focused, and it's all about how great Scrum is rather than how great Agile is, but it's useful for learning. Agileprocess.org is that um, site that I referenced in the thought for the day. Uh, again, I recommend reading it. The guy who writes it is very, very bright. And then finally, I have written a few blogs about um, this kind of stuff. So if you want to read them, brilliant. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, and that's it. That's everything. Uh, thank you very much. Cool. Do we have any questions? Yes? Is that, is that the E.G. Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, while we were preparing for this talk, I did actually um, come across Dave Thomas's blog um, online. Not me, my own blog, really weird, but um, the Dave Thomas. And his views are surprisingly similar to mine, so I was quite chuffed about that. Um, it would make it easier to kind of pretend that I'm him. Uh, but do search out his blogs. He's yeah, a bright guy and says some interesting stuff. But no, it's not the Dave Thomas. Anything else? Yeah. So when, when I've been involved in uh, Scrum practices before, it's normally user stories and things like that. Do you have a, a thought on how to make uh, the Scrum process work for tools and libraries that are being developed that aren't user-facing or don't, have, don't embody a user story? For instance, I don't know, a service that sends emails in the back, back end of a system. Um, how, how, to, how to get developer buy-in and, and build out a, a proper set of stories for that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it certainly is it's more difficult to do that because um, yeah, the ideal situation is you have a physical user who is there and you can actually talk to. Um, but there is always going to be a user of a system. So if you're kind of back-end sending emails, well, the person receiving that email is going to be the user. And So I guess it's as some other back-end system, I want this so that I can do some sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that, that I guess is how I would do it. I would, I would view whatever is consuming what you're creating as the user. And if that wasn't a human being, so I don't know, we're, we're building a message queue system. Yeah, so if that's not a human being, that's not a human being, obviously makes it a little bit more difficult. Yeah. But I guess you can, instead of going and speaking to an actual customer, you can go and speak to the developers of that other system um, and yeah, speak to them and see what they want. You, would you, so you would still stick with a user story? You wouldn't, so I've been involved in a, a project where we decided to drop user stories for this very reason and we mm. just started using tasks because writing a, a I will because I, etc. Just didn't make any sense. Yes. Um, um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a weird thing. So, user stories are something I always thought were very much part of Scrum. Um, and a bit of a surprise for me was they're not actually mentioned anywhere in the Scrum guide. So, that's worth getting out there first, is it's actually something from XP rather than from Scrum. In general, they do work well with Scrum. I wouldn't say that's true all of the time. Um, and in the situation you're describing, perhaps that's not true. Because I guess the thing with user stories is the thing they're really trying to get across is actually there's quite a lot of flexibility in how you implement those. You're, you're trying to avoid being prescriptive and saying, look, you must fix this problem in this particular way. You're more expressing an intention from the user. Whereas if you've got a really kind of tight API to follow, because that, that's the system that's been defined, they're probably a little bit less useful for you there. I think the, with um, iterations, it's kind of, it's still useful to take an iterative approach to those kind of things. So we've done a lot of similar projects, and the way we approach it is the first iteration, you'll start with something very simple like a stub implementation, which honors the API, which you can write your integration tests against, and then you can kind of, the next iteration can start fleshing out the functionality. But really, like you say, the, I think the problem with back-end projects is you've got to do a lot of work and a lot of iterations before you get to the stage where you can deliver any value to any kind of customer. And really, the customer is yourself. And I like to think of it as the customer is your future self in the next sprint. So what is going to enable the team? So maybe at the first sprint, you've only got a couple of developers working on this stub implementation. But the, the point is to get a code base in place and some tests in place that enable more developers to pile on in the next sprint. So thinking of, yeah, as the team itself, as the customer of the first few iterations until you get to a state where you can start delivering stuff to the end user. Yep, said it better than I could. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not sure how to frame this question because this is about one of the agile principles and I can't quite remember the wording of it. I can but skip back the, to the slide if you'd like. It was the one about the uh, contract negotiation. Yes. Yes. 
customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Yeah, collaboration is great, but if you've got a customer uh, and, and you know, you're talking about paying money for this, then uh, surely there's going to be the customer getting the best price for a particular deal, and at the same time knowing that there's going to be a certain amount of functionality in the money that you pays over. Yeah, so I think that's perhaps the sort of realist view of it. I think the idealist view of it is actually you as a technology company are interested in developing great software for your customers. They're interested in getting that software um, and I guess they trust you to actually produce that. And if that sort of relationship develops over time, then I think that's an entirely possible way of doing things because if you try and screw them over and make life as difficult as possible for them, well, you, you lose your customer. If they try and um, make things as hard as possible for you, they risk you going out of business or doing a worse job. So I think in that case, the actual collaboration is possible. However, I realize not all relationships develop over a long period of time. That's why contract negotiation is still a very important part of software development. And it's, it's something you can't get away from. But I guess what I would do is wherever possible move to the collaboration side of things rather than the negotiation. So don't necessarily get a really detailed fixed set of functionality down in your contract. Just say, um, yeah, we're going to do these kind of vague things, but we're going to do them to the best of our ability in the way that the customer wants. So I, that, that would be, it, it's sort of a direction you're trying to move rather than, yeah, you have to do customer collaboration rather than contract negotiation. And if you're working with someone that you don't know or haven't worked with them, work out what ways they can assess whether what they're getting is good enough. That's essentially what they're trying to do, is to protect themselves from going into a project with you where you say, oh, we're being, we're being wonderfully agile, and we're producing something completely different from what you want, but we're doing what we said. You know, uh, that, that's what they're trying to do, is to protect themselves. Yeah. So, so you're going to start with contract, but you've got to try and uh, get that contract such that it allows for the kind of collaboration that gives them the feedback that they're getting what they want. So, I think kind of the way we work, so we are a consultancy, we have that sort of situation quite a lot. And one of the things uh, in probably the biggest project I've worked on at Scott Logic, basically we had our clients come in and say, we want this big system. They weren't like, we're going to pay you a year's money up front and get you to develop that. They just said, right, we, we can afford to put up two months work. See what you've developed after two months. They were really pleased with that, so they put on another two months and just carried on like that because they were happy to just give us the money because we kept on proving ourselves. But they did it quite short term initially in order to protect themselves. And it means you have to keep delivering in order to yeah. keep the process going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cool. Any other questions? Do you do uh, any pair pro? Oh, sorry. To, I, no, go for it. Pair Start programming. <laughs> um, yeah. So again, pair programming is very much a uh, practice from XP, um, and it's one I'm quite a fan of. Um, I think it's one that perhaps people have again made a bit of a mess of. Uh, certainly one of my colleagues at Scott Logic in a previous job was mandated to work pair programming eight hours a day every day, um, worked with a bloke who he didn't particularly get on with and absolutely hated it, <laughs> which I don't blame him. I think I found that very stressful. Personally, I find it stressful to um, pair programming pair program for long periods of time. I think it's quite an intense way of working. Yeah. Now, because it's intense, it's incredibly productive and you tend to produce really, really good stuff but I don't think you can do it all the time. I also don't think it's applicable for all sorts of development. There are some parts of development that are just relatively menial and it's, it's fine for you to just sit there on your own and go and develop that. So I, I tend to, I do, I really like pair programming and it's one of those things I'm always like, I should do more of this, but I tend to find it works quite well in an ad hoc sort of way. So if you're like, right, it'd be really helpful to get another pair of eyes on this, get someone in to help you. And particularly one of the things I found really useful is um, quick rotation with pair programming. Um, so you do 15 minutes, the other person does 15 minutes. At the sort of extreme end, I've seen it work quite well with TDD, where you write a failing test, they implement the solution to it, yeah. they write a failing test, you um, implement the solution. Mm -hmm. Doing that on something that will really kind of drive you forwards for a little bit, so you're not there scratching your head for too long, that's great. And then separate for a little bit and do something else for a while. That, that kind of thing works really well for me, I think. Yeah. So you had a question? Yeah, um, I think the way that I was taught Agile and Scrum, using them together interchangeably there, was kind of very much in line with your talk. And so my question really is, I was kind of taught that you start with Scrum in the absence of anything, because Agile is vague, start with Scrum, and after the first iteration, you're not doing Scrum anymore, because you've inspected the process and you've adapted it. Mm -hmm. So you're not doing Scrum after the very first iteration, you're now into Agile. And I always kind of thought that was, because I was taught it that way, I always thought that was the way that it was intended. So is it, 
the, the two last points that seem mutually exclusive, you know, yeah. you inspect and adapt and then you can't change it. Yeah. Do you not think that was intended? Because I kind of thought that it was. Um, yeah, I would like to think that it was. I find it hard to sort of merge that together with the fact that they have said, look, it's immutable, you can't do it without that. And yeah, it's difficult for me to say what their actual intentions were. It just, it seems like that's what their intentions were when they wrote it. And I guess people perhaps implement it like that. But perhaps for me, it's not too important how they intended it, whether they did intend it to just be rigidly used um, forever, or as you described it, which is the way I would do it. Um, my, yeah, I, I would, I'd like to think that given these guys went off and wrote the Agile Manifesto, that that's exactly what they were thinking. I find it hard to kind of square that with what I've read in the Scrum Guide, but yeah, I, I would like to think that. Okay. It's, for me, it comes a little bit down to a Pyberia's talk where you've got the, <clears throat> the Agile Manifesto being more of the, the thing that's sort of the, the principles behind, <coughs> excuse me, behind something. Um, and then the, so the, the Scrum Guide is the implementation which is copyrighted, which means you can, you can look at it and you can change bits of it. But the trademark is the Scrum mm -hmm. badge, and as soon as you've changed it, you, know, you can change it if you like, yeah. but it's not Scrum anymore. I think that's, just... a, that's a kind of reasonable analysis of it, and it's one that I've heard is that they're like, yeah, we're putting our names to this, so if you go and do something that's kind of slightly different to Scrum and mess it up, then well, you can't come and blame us because you, you didn't follow what we said. So I think that might be, yeah, a reasonable analysis of it as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, sort of connected to that is, um, is the main purpose of you doing this talk because you think that people start doing Scrum, so therefore they think they're being agile, but they're not the they 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 fixate so much on the doing the defined processes in Scrum that they forget about the agile bit. Yeah, I get, so there are two sides. One of it is just a straightforward clarification of terms. I hear them used interchangeably. I've used them interchangeably for years, and I think I want to want to kind of get that clear what, what the difference is. But then, actually, yeah, far more important than the definition of terms is, is exactly that. Is is the fact that people start with Scrum and then get so focused on doing Scrum that they, they don't have any interest in agile. And like I said, I think it's the agile that's that's the important bit. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's that's certainly fair to say. Did you have a question as well? No, so I imagine that. That's fine. Cool. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Do we have time for more questions, Nick? How are we doing? The pizza's arrived, so. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Definitely no more questions then. <laughs> cool. Does anyone have anything else, or are we happy to finish there? Cool. Thank you very much, guys. Cool.